we go, fans. This is Calvin Barnes from the NCC Sports Never. Welcome back to Where Are They Now, where we take a look at former NCC student athletes and see what they're doing post NCCU. Joining me today from the football program is none other than Henry King. Henry is a former football tight end, has over 450 yards for his career and three touchdowns. He has also been in the police department for the past 20 years. Uh, most recently on May 7, 2018, he was named the chief of police in Edenton, North Carolina. These are just a few of his many accomplishments he's achieved here at NCCU and post-NCCU. Chief King, appreciate you joining me today, man. Thank you for having me, Gavin. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Man. I'm so excited to get into this, man. I did a lot of research, but for the people who may not know about you, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, Kevin, I was born and raised right here in Durham. I don't know if y'all still on campus called people from Durham, Dermites, but that was a nickname <laughs> that uh, they had for people that was from Durham. But yes, I was born and raised in Durham, went to Northern High School, played football at Northern High School up on the coach Ken Browning, which is over at Carolina. Uh, obtained a scholarship, played ball at Central, of course. I started off playing for Bishop Harris, and then I ended up my career uh, finishing up with Larry Little, the legendary Larry Little. Um, you know, I, you know, I majored in criminal justice, uh, you know, and I can tell you about the, the criminal justice program at NCCU. It does not get the credit that it should get nationwide. So let me tell you something. The law school gets the credit, but beneath the surface, NCCU criminal justice program is far best one of the, the best criminal justice programs in the nation. Uh, they have put out a lot of police chiefs and a lot of supervisors in law enforcement across this country. And we need to be able to tell our story better. Wow, man, that's great, man. Again, that's what we're here for, man. We're here for you to tell your story. Uh, so, you know, I kind of talked a little bit about you, you know, what you did post NCCU, but since you left, graduated NCCU, just tell the people, what have you been up to? Well, after graduating, um, I joined the, the Marine Corps. Happy birthday, today's November 10th, the day's the Marine Corps birthday. Um, and I learned a lot in the Marine Corps. Um, the Marine Corps taught me a lot. Uh, it prepared me. Uh, for the real world, just like Central prepared me for the real world. It was an extra tool to go in my toolbox. And after that, I joined the Rocky Mountain Police Department where I worked 18 years. I worked my way from police officer all the way up to the rank of captain. Um, uh, 10 years of my uh, experience at Rocky Mountain Police Department, I spent those times in internal affairs. And that's where I became the, um, uh, and learned the passion of policing with passion as, and also policing the police. And understanding that, yes, not all police officers are bad, but we have two or three percent of police officers that mess up, and we deal with those appropriately. So, you know, um, NCCU, again, does not uh, get the credit that it should get. You know, I think guys like Dr. Wilson, Dr. Harvey McMurray, I mean, they were a blessing to me and my career in law enforcement. Let's go ahead and rewind it back to your college days, you playing at NCCU. Uh, just tell us some of your favorite moments playing on the field at NCCU. Oh man, some of my favorite moments of playing, uh, you know, uh, we had this bootleg play where I would block down and then I would, and uh, it would be a reverse and, and I would slide back out to a quick out and, uh, and catch me a, a touchdown pass. Or better yet, one of my favorite moments was, you know, I, uh, I love weightlifting. You know, I became one of the strongest football players and probably still strongest tight end in NCCU history. And um, in one game, Coach Little moved me over to play off offensive tackle against Central State Ohio. And uh, yes, I fussed about my stats being messed up, but I mean, it was an <laughs> honor to be able to play offensive tackle and fill in for one of my counterparts who had got hurt and couldn't play that game. So that's one of my best moments, playing tackle, uh, doing a football game. You talked about some of the stuff, your fair memories on the field. Again, people forget you're a student athlete. So what are some of your memories as a student off the field to play at NCCU? Oh well, man, off the field, it was just the, the, the unity and the dedication and the love that um, Central displayed. You know, I remember people like Miss Sarah Bell Lucas, who ensured that we uh, signed up for the right classes. You know, um, I remember just, you know, Coach Lavelle, who was a basketball player, you know, he was in the basketball team lived above us in Chili Hall. So just getting to know, you know, individuals and, um, and bonding with them. And, and these are friends and individuals that if I pick up the phone right now, and if, if I was visiting a certain area, you know, they would tell me, you're not in the hotel room. You come stay with me and my family. You know, that, that's what I look for at NCCU. And that's what I love about NCCU. Just the, the, the friendship and the bonds that, we, that you build over the years. That's great, man. Again, you talk about that family, that family atmosphere. You know, let's talk about that football program a little bit. You know, you play on, on their coach, little, the legendary coach. Talk about how that was, you know, playing with him and then all your other various, you know, legendary coaches that you've had here. He brought a... a what I call true discipline to the NCCU football team. And he brought this, he brought a good scheme that allowed us to run and pass. I mean, Coach Little, Coach Little, uh, and I don't say this about many people, but Coach Little was, was truly a second father to me. I mean, I, 
I grew up with both my mom and dad in the home. But let me tell you something. Coach Little was just not a football coach. He was a father to the football team. He gave us advice like a father would. He pushed us. He mentored us. He prayed with us. You couldn't ask for a better coach. And I appreciate Coach Little for over these years. Let's jump ship to, you know, 2020. You know, the head coach now, you know, Coach Trey Oliver, your teammate. Also, you know, the tight ends coach, Coach Mozawell, again, a former teammate. So just talk about, you know, what they were like, you know, playing alongside them and just seeing them now at the coaching level now. Wow. Well, you know what? I was so proud of, of Coach Oliver and Coach uh, Ware getting the job on campus. Um, you know, I remember Moses Ware, we came in together. And Moses was – you know, the Jerry Rice of football. And I'm telling you, he studied, he slept, he ate routes, you know, and his routes, I mean, he would practice so much on routes, it was just like a paper cut. It, it, would, it would go deep on you. And Trey Oliver was the Deion Sanders of the game. And I can tell you that Trey, even though he was young, a little bit younger than us, he molded with the, with the seniors and he took on that, that uh, inspiration of wanting to learn and be humble. And he also studied his craft, you know. And I can tell you, you know, if I had to compare those two together, if I had to say it was, you know, Moses versus um, uh, Coach Oliver, it's like, it's almost like saying Dion versus Jerry Rice, but I got to give it to you. I'm going to give it to Coach Moore, I mean, Coach Mo Ware, because Coach Mo Ware, he, I mean, uh, he would cut everybody off. He wouldn't go to any parties. He wouldn't go anywhere. Mo was on the football field morning, noon, and night. Besides studying, he was on that field running them routes. So you're saying, you know, if they faced off one-on-one, -on -one, I'm pretty sure they did it in practice. 1v1, you taking Coach Moware over Coach Oliver? Oh, yeah. He'll break them ankles all day long. <laughs> <laughs> He'll break um, them ankles all day long. Oh, sorry, man. sorry, Trey. I'm just being honest. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely got to We definitely got to have that, you know, you know hopefully you know, this whole COVID pandemic and everything, you know, we kind of bring that count full circle and just kind of, you know, talk about some of these stories. But, uh, you know, speaking of stories with, you know, Coach Oliver, you know, Coach Ware, again, like I said, you knew him as teammates. Any funny stories about them, you know, as the player that people may not know about them? Yeah, I mean, you know, well, I can tell you, um, Oliver was one of those guys, man, that, you know, he was an informal leader. And, you know, he would check you. If you were out here and you weren't in, uh, in the dorm like you were supposed to be or you were uh, eating uh, just food that you were not supposed to be eating because we were trying to be healthy and have a good team, Trey would call you out on it. You know, I guess the younger generation, you would call it a snitch. But, <laughs> however, Trey was doing the right thing for the football team. And that's one thing I appreciate about him. You know, everybody thought that he was the coach's boy, but he wanted the coach's boy. What he was doing was being an informal leader and putting everybody in check. So if he saw me going back for seconds, you know, he would ask me, do, do, do you really need them seconds? Are you, are you, or you just want to go back and eat something? So, but Moses Ware, again, man, when it, when it, when it comes to Moses Ware, you know, uh, if he was so critical on himself, if Mo would drop a pass, or if I would drop a pass, here come Moses Ware, you know, telling me, come on now, you, you, you got to get that. And I would be like, Mo, you just dropped the pass yourself. But again, he wasn't being critical of me. He was just only giving me that uplift and then that love that we needed to hear from one another. So I appreciate Mo. I mean, it, it was in his spirit. And again, Mo would, Mo would uh, call you out if you didn't go out on the football field on Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock when it was our day off to, to practice. He believed in practice wholeheartedly. And that's one reason I tell you, the combination that y'all have essentially with head coach Trey Oliver and, uh, and uh, Moses were, y'all got some of the best coaches across the nation. I would uh, I would put that by far. Again, like I said, great coach, you know, coming in here. You know, hopefully we can, you know, build upon what the foundation they're trying to set right now. Uh, you know, you talk about Coach Oliver, you know, he was kind of strict and everything. You know, the Coach Oliver now, you know, he's, he, you know, he's still accountable. You know, he's still accountability. But now he's, you know, he got a little bit of a fun side, got a little bit of a joking side. Has he, you know, has that developed over time? Or was he just like, you know, joking like that, you know, when he was playing with you? Trey has always been a straight business type guy. I mean, but he, uh, but he would show his emotional side. And it's okay. But I, I always respected him because he was always business first. You know, they, he knew that there was a time to have fun, but you have fun after the mission is complete. And I can respect that. You know, being in the Marine Corps, I want everybody to let their hair down and have fun, but we, but we, we got to accomplish the mission. And the mission for Trey at that time was making sure that nobody scored or nobody beat him deep. And our mission was to push the ball down the field and score a touchdown. And, you know, you talked about, you know, joining the Marine Corps and everything. So after NCCU, you know, you joined the Marine Corps. Uh, talk about that process and, you know, why you decided to join the Marines. Well, I'll tell you why I decided to join the Marines. You know, uh, back, in, back in my days, you know, uh, my parents told me you have to have a college degree. So that was the thing when I graduated from high school. You got to have a college degree. So while at Central, I had these big dreams. 
I was going to the FBI. So I got my degree and I applied for the FBI and I did not get in the FBI because I didn't have any supervisor experience. So I was wondering, well, how in the world am I going to get supervisor experience getting my education in college? I can't supervise anybody because I'm not in law enforcement. So I joined the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps taught me a lot, gave me the supervisor experience. I rose up to the rank of sergeant uh, in the Marine Corps. And uh, it prepared me for law enforcement, you know. Uh, and that was the best thing. It was the best decision that I ever made because I can tell you, I actually grew up in the Marine Corps, because I learned a lot and, and learned a lot of responsibility. After the Marine Corps, you decided to join the police force. Uh, you know, you said the Marines prepared you for that. You're trying to get super, supervisor experience. Uh, just talk about that process in joining the police force and just, you know, getting in there from the Marines and what the differences was from the Marines to the police force. The big difference between the Marine Corps and the civilian world and the police force, because I was an MP my last two years in the Marine Corps. So if I, uh, if I told the Marine to the, uh, the stop, come see me, you know, Marine Corps is all about uh, instant obedience, willingness to orders. So if I said, hey, Marine, come here, the Marine came. But in civilian world, didn't it, work, it didn't work that way when I became police. As soon as I said stop, somebody ran. And, I, and so it was a big transition coming from the civilian world, I mean, coming out of the military world to the civilian world. But I enjoyed it because what I saw was that the things that the Marine Corps prepared me for uh, was that no matter how bad it gets, you know, there's always somebody that's, uh, that would love to be in your place. And, and, and going overseas to third world countries, Japan, Singapore, Philippines, I saw how blessed that we, that we, we, that we are have here in America. And, I, and, and what I saw was, I didn't see kids wanting to drop out of school at 16 because most times overseas, if your parents don't have the money, then you can't get educated. You have to go get a job. So, you know, I, I go back and spread these messages to our kids in America so like instead of want to drop out of school, try to get as much education as you can, because there's a lot of people that would love to be in your shoes, love to have some of the things that you have. So Marine Corps prepared me to be able to come out in this deal with them, with anything that the world threw at me. And, uh, and I love that. I wanted to always be a police officer. Um, obviously, uh, you know, being a federal agent is what I uh, stemmed to be. But over the years, I started uh, getting promoted throughout the years, and I never just went back and applied full time to be a federal agent but I'm sworn in right now with Department of Homeland Security. You were Rocky Mount's first cop in the Officer Next Door program. Can you talk to the people what that program is and how important it was for that community? Yes, it was very important. Listen, the Officer Next Door program is the city of Rocky Mount um, purchased a home and they uh, received funds from HUD to uh, refurbish it. And it was in a low income social economic poverty neighborhood. And my duties uh, in order to live in that house was to do five hours a week, 20 hours a month, patrolling that neighborhood on my day off attend one community meeting a month and establish block captains and address issues in that neighborhood. And it was the best thing that I've ever done throughout my whole career because I built a relationship with the community. Now, I didn't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I cleaned the whole entire neighborhood up. I did not. However, I, I was able to gain trust and build relationships in the neighborhood where kids and people struggle. And I can tell you that I miss it. And I think police departments across this country should find a way to have officer next door programs, one for recruiting wise. Just imagine, Calvin, you're out of college trying to find somewhere to, to work, and here's a place where you can, uh, once you get off probation as a police officer, you can live, patrol this uh, a neighborhood, not have to worry about paying rent. You're paying rent, but in the form of patrolling, uh, and not have to worry about a, a mortgage, and you can save your money, save your 401k, but also build relationship. I mean, that's a win win, because every police chief should want every police officer to live in the city that they police. It doesn't do, do me any good for my officers to live in Elizabeth City and drive my car to Elizabeth City. They should be seen in Edenton. So that's a perfect scenario for any police chief, have all my officers live in the community that they serve. And, you know, you talked about that. Uh, why exactly does that not happen, you know, where, you know, people who have to, you know, patrol and serve the community aren't really directly connected with them? You know, you have cost of living issues. You have, um, you have, salaries. So I'm going to use the Hamptons, for example. The Hamptons are up in New York. There's a lot of police officers up in the Hamptons that make a lot of money. They make over $100,000 a year as a police officer. But guess what? They don't live in the Hamptons because you have to have open rent for money in order to live in the Hamptons. So unfortunately, they are driving, you know, patrol cars, you know, out of the, uh, the city of Hamptons to somewhere else and then driving them back. So you have to be able to raise your salaries up, but then have something to offer for, uh, for your staff, it's not police officers, I'm talking about firefighters, school teachers, you know, things, great incentives that, that allow them to stay in your community to, to help thrive in your community.
So it's a, it's a social economic factor that, that goes in line. I'm not advocating, yes, yes, I would love for us to get a pay raise in law enforcement, but you have to have other things in fact. What has your, you know, discussions that you've had with your department over the summer to, you know, to invoke change? We believe in 21st century policing up under President Obama. And when he came out with that, you know, I've been living by it. I'm not going to see it in my sleep. Treating people with dignity and respect, conveying trustworthy motives, being neutral and transparent in decision making, and giving people voice during the encounters. We live by that at the Eden Police Department. And it is very important that my officers understand that the way I treat them internal is the way that I expect them to treat my customers external. So if I'm giving you the same authority and respect, that's what I want you to give my citizens out here that we that, that, that actually pay our salary. Their tax dollars pay our salary. But on the flip side of that, when people are talking about social justice and social change, then especially in the Afro-American community, we have to have a seat at the table. I need minorities to stop telling their kids, not all of them, but some of them stop telling their kids to fear the police, not be the police, and come join this force. Come, this is a noble profession. Let me give your son and daughter a job. Let me allow them to uh, move up the ranks so they can have a seat at the table, just like Chief King, Chief Davis, and, and other chiefs in North Carolina. Because I can give you a little tad bit, Calvin, you, you probably didn't know. If you look at this, right now, history has been made in North Carolina, but nobody's talking about it. Right now, North Carolina has the most Afro-American police chiefs and sheriffs that it's ever had in the history of North Carolina. And all your major cities, Charlotte, Greensboro, Durham, Forsyth, Cumberland County, uh, Rocky Mount slash Escombe, and Wilson all have Afro-American police chiefs and sheriffs in those counties. Think about that. That's a, And then we got 100 counties, but you got a lot of sheriffs that are Afro-American sheriffs. And history has been made, so things are changing in this world. But we got to be a part of the chain. We can't complain and they don't bring any, any solutions. And my solution is allow me to hire your daughter and son. You know, because had I listened to my great grandmother who grew up in Longburg, North Carolina, I would have never became the police because of her experiences in the 70s. But thank God I, I was able to make my own decision and see things a little bit different than what she saw and what she experienced. You think, you know, having a seat at the table comes back to something like that officer next door program where, you know, if the officers are living in that community, you know, if the people are seeing that officer, maybe they will inspire, you know, aspire to be that uh, officer one day? Yes. That, Calvin, uh, plays a, a, a significant part because now the kids get to see the officer not only on patrol, but it, rocking, walking around their community, engaging the kids. But I'm gonna tell you something, Kevin, it shows like you have right here. Being in this platform, I wish that there was a Kevin Barnes at NCCU doing this when I was there. And I'm gonna tell you why, I'm, I'm being, being honest, I'm gonna tell you why. Because now these young men and women at Central, if they, when they watch this, they know that, hey, I got a, someone, an alumni that I can call that I wanna get in law enforcement, and I, want, I can call him and ask him for some advice. I wish that I had a Kevin Barnes that I could have asked, you know, back in 1995, say, hey, I want to get into law enforcement. Can you put me in, in, in contact with somebody that, uh, that, you know, that's been on your show that's in the ATF or that's in the U.S. Marshals or that's at Durham PD, uh, you know, versus the word of mouth. So now social media and your generation, oh, man, it's going to take it to the next level. As an alumni, what would you say to a student athlete or just a student in general, you know, thinking about being a police officer at NCCU? Yes, I would tell them, listen, not only the criminal justice uh, department, but any other major at Central, this is a noble profession and we need those eagles. Because I know whatever, no matter what your major, major is at Central, you are, are part of a top-notch university and you can make a difference in law enforcement and you definitely can make a difference uh, coming from Central and getting into this the, uh, this field of work. And I would tell them to please apply. Don't let some of the things that you see on TV negatively affect your perception about law enforcement because we this is a, a, another profession and we are making a difference. And I need, like I said, I want to hire you. You know, I'm, I'm in a position now to where, guess what? If you meet the criteria, you're a college graduate, you, you, you're somewhat in shape, we can get you in shape. Uh, you're up front on your paperwork that you filled out, you pass your polygraph, you got a job, you know? And, and obviously you want to look at strategically a place where you want to work at. Some, want to, some might want to work in Charlotte because they love the nightlife. Some may love fishing, so, so they want to come down here where I'm at on the Albemarle Sound. So you have to pick the area what's best for you and the apartment that's best for you. That's just like trying to pick what fraternity that, that you want to belong to. All of them are great, but you know, you want to pick that fraternity that bits best fits you, that you feel like that's going to be, uh, give you the best um, outcome. 
in life. You know, you talked about the criminal, uh, you know, Justice Department Institute, how it's one of the best and how it's so great. Again, can you kind of go further in detail on what makes that department specifically one of the best in the uh, nation? Well, I can tell you, right now, I sit on the North Carolina Sentencing Commission as a commissioner here in North Carolina, and I would have never thought that in 2020 that I would be sitting on the commission as a commissioner sitting right next to Dr. Harvey McMurray, the same professor that taught me research at Central. That goes, I mean, we, we make some big decisions at the Census Commission, and, and that goes to show that Central, again, under Dr. Wilson, he was the head of the department then when I was there, and Dr. Harvey McMurray taught research. We have people that have had a seat at the table for many of years, you know, and they, like, again, they have pushed out so many of uh, students that have gone to be police chiefs uh, in Ferguson and the ATF and other places. I mean, again, just, just like you said, Students can reach out to me whether they want a job at Edenton or, or, or whether they want a job somewhere else. And I'm willing to give them that advice and give them all the information and even tell them what to do and what they need to do because that's their ego love. That's what we do. We look out for one another. We mold one another. I can't even tell you the times that, you know, so many coaches and Dr. Harvey McMurray, I love that man because he was a professor that says, I do not give true, false, multiple choice questions, test questions. I only give fill in the blank and essay. He made you learn, and you had to go through him in order to graduate. So thank you, Dr. Harvey Matt Murray. I appreciate it. During the time you played, you know, you played during the Division II era. Now, you know, NTC is now officially Division I for, you know, the past 10 years or so. Uh, talk about the development you've seen from NCCU Athletics, you know, being D2 and now being the D1 program. Oh, man, I, I love it. I mean, I, I'm praying for the day that we can get the money together uh, for, for the football team to get a, a field house where they can come out of, of their own very own field house but I, I, I love it. Uh, I mean, it's uh, us being D1 has really set our game up. It, it's, it's been great to be able to sit home some days. I can't drive to Durham uh, to, to watch our, you know, games on TV. I tell you, the only downside and the only thing that I would I could say negative about being D1 now versus D2 is every now and then, because you only know what you know, I do miss you know, the, the occasional playing Shaw University or Fayetteville <laughs> State or Elizabeth State. I mean, but I mean, but I understand we're growing now. I mean, and, and with growth, you can't always do what you used to do in order to improve. So I get it. And I see the improvement has has taken us to the next level uh, under the leadership of uh, Coach Oliver. You know, in the middle of a pandemic, how has that affected the police force, uh, you know, with that, with the whole COVID-19 stuff? We haven't had the opportunity uh, to have that face-to-face -face with the community, but we're, but we're having Zoom meetings. And, and honestly, you know, I'm enjoying Zoom now. I would, uh, you know, I don't want to sound cheap, but you know, I wish they could, uh, they, uh, that Zoom was as popular two or three years ago to where I could have sent my guys to Zoom training that I had to send them to Greensboro, pay hotel room and uh, and meals. I can just put them on a Zoom class and they can take the class. So honestly, technology is working for the best. But it's nothing like having that face-to-face -face conversation and be able just to just interact with people uh, on certain things. But uh, but I, I love it. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, we have to be careful. We're on the front lines. Uh, and uh, I pray for the day that we can get a, a cure for this thing. But um, as law enforcement, we're going to keep pushing on. We're going to stick. We're going to keep uh, engaging people um, uh, as much as we can. We're going to keep our mask on and we're going to help the public. What's one thing that you learned about yourself during this whole pandemic quarantine situation? Well, I'll tell you one thing that I learned about myself. I learned that that technology is not as bad as I think it is. Because like, <laughs> had, you told me, had you told me three years ago that I was going to be doing a bunch of Zoom, I would have told you, no, nah, I'm driving there. But actually, I love to. I have embraced Zoom or or Teamster, or the different other platforms that are out there. And I, I honestly, Kevin, I actually live in there. I was like, man, I can actually sit in my office and get, you know, multitask. I can get a lot of stuff done. And still, I mean, I've set on promotional processes uh, the via Zoom. So, I mean, it's, it's a great tool to have. March 7, 2018, you're officially named the Chief of Police at Edenton, North Carolina. Talk about the emotion, the feeling it was to finally have, you know, that verification that, yes, I am now the Chief of Police. Chief. Oh man, it was a, it was truly a blessing. I have worked hard, you know. Uh, again, I, I, I'll tell you like this: Dr. Harvey McMurray, well, my, my parents, of course, Dr. Harvey McMurray, the Marine Corps, so much things that I learned at Central prepared me to be a chief. And now that I am a chief, I want to go out and spread my wings like a true eagle and help anybody who wants to get a job in law enforcement anywhere. I sit on the North Carolina Police Chiefs Association as a, as a board of directors, and I have connections with a lot of the chiefs across this state. Uh, and some even out of state. So if you're looking to apply somewhere out of state, I may or may or may not know the sheriff or police chief in that area that you want to go. So Eagle fans or Eagles, give me a call. I got your back.
that we all about equal pride. When you take a look back at your time here at NCC, are there anybody that you would like to thank and credit for? The floor is yours. I mentioned Miss Sarah Bell Lucas, uh, who, who ensured that we all took the right class at Central. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, the legendary coach Larry Little. But let me tell you about somebody who I will never forget, and I use his term as of the day. So I call myself uh, showing. I call myself showing up late to uh, to class one day, uh, gym class, uh, under Coach Robert Stonewall Jackson, Coach Jack. And I remember him. it was a Tuesday and Thursday class. And I remember him telling me, "King, King, you're too late for the day, and you're too early for Thursday. See you later, bye." And I was never late for Coach Jack class again. That right there taught me, it embarrassed me, but it taught me a lot. One, that coach is always serious, and he expects his football players to be serious, but he taught me a life learned lesson. If you're serious about what you're trying to do in life, you can't be just bopping in the room late, you know, doing what you want to do. The world doesn't work that way, and life doesn't work that way. And I live by that, and I miss Coach Jack. He's passed away and gone now, but I will never forget Coach Jack telling me that I was too late for the day and too early for Thursday. <laughs> and I can tell you, the last person, the last person that I would like to give uh, that shout out uh, again would be Dr. Harvey McMurray, who who really was instrumental in a lot of people making sure that they learned in criminal justice and applied themselves and read the material and exhort the material and learned. Well, describe your time at NCCU in three words. My time at NCCU well, again was love. The football team we love one another. We love all other sports, but we definitely had love for one another. I can't tell you how many time that my mama fed the entire football team with me being from Durham, or they may have washed their clothes over at, at my house. Dedication, we all were dedicated to one another. And then again, unity. The main thing was we were unified. You know, there were times on the way back uh, from a game that if we, if we won or lost, that somebody may bring up something that somebody didn't do, but it was all constructive criticism. It was never pointing the finger or blaming anyone. It was like, how, how can we learn from what we did and not make mistakes for the next game? And I appreciate that under the leadership of Coach Little, Coach Washington, um, and all the rest of the coaches have Coach J.D. Hall, who passed away. I mean, I love those guys, man. Last thing before we wrap up here, is there anything else that you would like to say to people watching this video? Yes. I'm going to be strict, and I'm going to be firm with, the, with, with those Eagles. If we really want to make change in law enforcement, hear Henry King, hear me well. Please apply to be a police officer anywhere in this country. If you are an Eagle criminal justice major, if you're a biology major, whatever your field may be, law enforcement needs good people. And Central, North Carolina State University produces good people in this profession. And I'm counting on you to, to make a difference in law enforcement. And again, those y'all who want to get in law enforcement, whether it's federal, state, or local, Gavin, I am one person I'm sworn in as a police chief, I'm sworn in as, as a North Carolina Secretary of State Task Force Officer, and I'm sworn in as the Department of Homeland Security, Title 19 Federal Agent. So I got three badges but one paycheck, but however, I got connections to be able to help those fellow Eagles if they want the help. You gotta pick up the phone and call me. And you can call me at 252-482-9890. That goes directly to my cell phone number. And I look forward to hearing from any Eagle they want to get a job in this local profession called law enforcement. Gotcha. Thank you again. You know, Coach King, you know, former football player King, tight end, offensive tackle, uh, chief of police, Henry King. Thank you again for your time, the wise words, the message that you sent to people. And again, I enjoyed interviewing, man, and this, I had fun learning a lot more stuff, man. But that'll be it for this episode of Where Are They Now? We'll be taking a look at former NTCU student athletes and see what they're doing post-NCCU. My name is Kevin Barnes from the NCCU Sports Network. Be sure to check out all the content on all our social media platforms. Remember, equal pride, amplified. We'll catch you the next time, y'all.